Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start as if we have our audience with us. So firstly, I'm going to welcome everybody to um, this session for the U21 Health Sciences Annual Meeting. We're looking at the U21 University Mental Health Declaration in a post-COVID world. Um, I'm delighted to be here facilitating this afternoon's session. Uh, particularly uh, given that we have a number of students joining us. And I think the voice of students um, in anything we do, particularly related to mental health, is really important. Uh, so I'm very, I'm very much delighted that you're with us. Uh, for those of you who are joining us um, as, uh, as uh, in the audience, uh, just to make sure you mute yourselves. And also, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat function and also that the uh, session is being recorded. Uh, so, as I said, we've got this, the, the, the session, we're very tight on time, we've got three sections, the first section, well, really two main sections, we've got, we've got the first section is going to be talking to two of our leads here in the, uh, the U21 uh, mental health group, which is uh, Annie Tamani uh, from the University of Johannesburg, and Mar Maria Gardani from uh, the University of Glasgow. And uh, these, they're going to talk to the U21 uh, mental, mental health chart uh, declaration, and then we're going to hear how students have been working on that within their own institutions. And then we're going to move to um, our uh, third part of the session where we have Gareth Hughes, who's going to talk us through the whole university approaches to student mental health. So uh, the two uh, people who are going to start us off are uh, Professor Annie Tamani, who is an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Vice Dean for Research and Internationalization at the University of Johannesburg. And also we have Dr. Maria Gardani, who is a lecturer in the School of Psychology at the University of Glasgow, um, both of whose bios are in your program. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Maria and Annie to uh, take us through the first part of this session. So, um, and welcome to everybody, because I know we've got people er early in the morning, middle of the afternoon, late in the evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for introducing us. And I think maybe if uh, Amelia can put up the slides, but just to give you background with the University, uh, University U21 Mental Health Declaration, this process started long time ago. And then I think it started in 20, um, 2018. And uh, we as a group actually have done very well. And we've come this far, there was a survey which went out and then at the end, we have these key five principles. And Maria will talk a bit about how we came to, I'll, I'll, let me talk about the principles. So we've got these key five principles that I need to focus on, but I'm not going to go into that a lot because Maria needs to introduce our pilot. So the, the principles basically are looking at the student and staff mental well being in the universities and how important that is to consider and how the university takes into consideration whether they should look after their own staff and after their students in order to have to foster a stigma-free environment. So where we are at right now with our declaration is that we've asked our students to participate and Maria will introduce them and take over to introduce our pilot. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Maria, if Maria is around. Hello, thank you so much, Annie, for the short introduction and welcome all from wherever around the world you are. So Annie introduced the principles as they've been crafted and drafted over a couple of um, changes over the past years. So what as a group, as the U21 uh, University of Mental Health Working Group wanted to put forward was ways to get the students involved and pretty much work in their own institutions. For this project, we've chosen the University of Glasgow and the University of Johannesburg in this like project, getting together, trying to see the regional reviews of what work is happening and how we can actually map these principles across the current provisions. This pilot project, we hope that will give us insight into the activities taking place across the network future programs for this one we're just trying to see what we can find in the respective universities of Glasgow and Johannesburg and also we're trying to build together a collaborative cultural uh, perspective given that we have one institution from the um, 
from the UK and one from uh, South Africa. So that was really insightful, getting students from across the globe pretty much working together and trying to see whether this, past, this pilot will give us insight and how we can do it across the G21 network. The students uh, from uh, both respective institutions will then will now talk to you about their project and how far we came. So pass on to Amelia. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Amelia. I'm one of the researchers from the University of Glasgow. Um, and as you can see, this is a wonderful collaboration between both of our universities. Um, I'm going to start off with the project aims. So our main aim was to gather student and staff perspectives on the extent to which both universities adhere to the principles. We wanted to gather the opinions of students and staff on improvements that both institutions can make to better fulfill these principles and record and reflect upon the successes and challenges we had along the way. So uh, our first step was brainstorming the existing provisions and thinking about the ways that we could gather this useful information. We then developed a questionnaire in collaboration with the University of Johannesburg students to explore the opinions of people around our universities. And we then agreed on a set of core questions based on the principles, but in order to make sure that both location could gather as much useful information for their projects as possible. We developed different versions of this based on what we thought would work best. So from the U of G perspective, we developed a questionnaire which included Likert scale ratings. So that's how much you agree versus disagree on a scale of one to seven um, of various statements which were based on the principles. And then we added further options for participants to add a bit of an explanation for their choices so we could gather some useful qualitative data. And I'll hand over to my co-researcher, Joseph. So hello, my name is Joseph. I also work on this project with Amelia and the University of St. Johannesburg. So initially this slide was gonna be called challenges. Yeah, along the process of this pilot project, we found not only challenges, but in reflecting on the project, we found numerous positive and vital points that helped move our learning and understanding forward. So primarily in conducting the interviews and talking to students, it was so clear that there's, there's so much passion from the students in talking about student mental health and in services that affect them. And within this like data we collected, there's such diversity and in-depth data set that gives us lots of unique and compelling perspectives around subjects of mental health and wellbeing. Another positive instance of this project was collaboration in collaborating with the University of Johannesburg, as we got lots of different direction and perspective from Mapaseka and Sipsitu, which really worked well and I think we're all really proud of what we created with this project. In regards to the limitations or the barriers that we found in this pilot, we found that time was quite difficult in not only collecting such rich data over short, short videos and editing this down. So we wanted to include enough detail, but also limit it into a reasonable time frame. And then the other issue was regarding the ethics application, as it was explicitly stated, the personal identifying nature of the data in regards to personal experience in video and audio footage which we did manage to solve in the end. The main points that we gathered from our data, um, and we put these in relation to the principles, were the long wait time to access counselling service deterred many students we interviewed from seeking help, and they felt it was inadequate to support the student needs at the university. The Good Cause system, which is our system for requesting work extensions for students, uh, was thought to need more care, flexibility and understanding to support students when they're feeling particularly overwhelmed. Um, additionally, inaccessibility issues for people with various disabilities regarding the layout of campus, the layout of teaching and the university resources can create a negative cycle where it negatively impacts people's mental health, which impacts their physical health and it can create a difficult university experience. Uh, and finally, a charity that works closely with disabled students on campus said that they felt the university hadn't adequately responded to their complaints. Um, so they felt that that contributed to a stigma surrounding mental illness and didn't serve all groups of the university equally. And now we'll head over to the South Africa researchers. and I'll be taking you through the University of Johannesburg. Um, in order to assist with mental health, the University of Johannesburg has the Center for Psychological Services and Career Development, which is also known as PSYCHED, which is an initiative that offers a broad spectrum of psychological education services to students 
and staff as well as the wider community. Um, in order to see how mental health was received within our institution, we conducted a small scale study where we asked students from five departments on what do they perceive mental health as and their level insight with regards to psychic and in service and its services. And what we find is that majority of the students do see the need and the emphasis of improved mental health awareness in, within the institution. We also noted that most of the students do face immense stress, which lead to mental illness because of the pressure and the workload within the tertiary level. It was a concerning for us to find that most students prefer to keep it within themselves if they have problems rather than talking to others. But it is important to also note that some of the students were comfortable enough to share their problems with others, be either the lecturers, their friends, their parents, or psychic. And it was also good to note that majority of the students are aware of what psychic is and how to access it. But it was concerning to find that even though they know what psychic is and how to access it, most of them don't go and attend psychic services. Um, in this type of times that we find ourselves in, some students feel that psychic is not doing enough to cater for their mental health needs. Therefore, it is imperative that this initiative avail itself to more students, such that a wider population is assisted with their mental health. Uh, thank you so much, Sipaseti. Uh, again, I am Mapaseka, and I'll be taking you through the principles in relation to PsychEd. So basically, PsychEd services includes counselling, whereby we have um, psychologists with that are registered under the Health Professions Council of South Africa, um, which ensures that our students prov are provided with the best counselling services. Uh, also noting that uh, we have um, uh, initiatives such as um, career expose, um, we have uh, achievement awards, and um, also with the counseling services, it includes 24-7 uh, uh, services, which our students uh, felt that um, they were assisted of, of them. However, it was uh, quite um, a, a challenging uh, or a bit disturbing to note that uh, some of the services that PSYCHED is meant to uh, provide, such as 24-hour services, one of our students mentioned that she couldn't be able to contact a PSYCHED during recess, um, because uh, during recess, most of the services were closed, and um, she also couldn't contact um, the 24-hour services there when she called them. So it's such aspects really that that uh, made us aware that PSYCHED, since it's uh, the only institution that deals with mental health, there are some challenges with regards to providing mental health. So it's quite similar with regards to the University of Glasgow as well, that uh, more emphasis is needed for mental health for students, particularly in this um, unprecedented times. Thank you. Um, Annie, um, uh, uh, Maria, um, do you know who's taking this? Now, I think this part we're going to uh, we're going to go off. Uh, I think we can move to the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, if, if, to, uh, Again, I am Apasika, and I'll be taking you through the principal in relation to PSYCHED. So basically, PSYCHED services includes counseling, whereby we have um, psychologists with that are registered and that our students prov are provided with the best counseling. Counseling services. Uh, also noting that uh, we have. Um, uh, Clearly, we have some technical problems, and probably we're hearing yes. the recording of this session. Yeah, we'll I think it's the recording now. It's the recording. Yeah, I, yeah. Yes, I think it's the recording. I think we have to go, Barbara, to the questions now. Initiatives such as um, career expose. I'm hearing that. The I hear there are barriers that so you, you, you people don't want to help they don't seek help for lots of different reasons it could be that the time of the service isn't right it could be that there's the stigma so 
in terms of solutions, I'm always interested from the student's perspective in terms of a solution. If you were asked, what would an ideal solution look like? Um, now, obviously, we are mindful that budgets are always in the back of every university's um, uh, thinking, but what, what, where could universities be better? Um, and what could they do to make it either less stigmatizing and, and more accessible? What are the kind of things we, as, as kind of people in institutions, should be doing for our students? Um, if I was to speak if I was to speak about this issue, I'd say that a lot of the time students feel quite neglected in institutions as they are a massive space and it feels like you're very much left alone within this big space. So I think the biggest essence of what I gathered from talking to people was there needs to be greater levels of communication because waiting lists are going to be apparent whether there's a situation. But if there's, there's communication between staff and students that they know that if there is someone there to support them alongside this waiting list and that would really greatly help their mental health within this time of waiting to get help. Okay. Amelia, you wanted to have a comment as well? Yes, one thing one of our participants suggested was being assigned a personal well-being tutor, aside from a studies tutor, who would check in with you regularly and their sole purpose would be to make sure outside of academics and the sort of sometimes pressure and professional relationship that some students feel needs to be maintained within that someone who specifically looks after you which I thought was we thought was an interesting uh, idea that might be worth trying and uh, so Tutu, what about you from from your perspective um, um, what 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 would you see as solutions that would be useful from the University of Jones what I noticed is that um, Saika does do awarenesses do send us emails every day letting us know about them it's more on the students perspective where most students don't want to go out and actually seek help and everything so maybe if you can try now and find ways maybe create awareness for students let no let us know from the students perspective of what is it that they want from psychic think that way we'll be able to to mend everything together because now it's all about psyche telling us what to do we need to tell psyche what is it that we expect from them that's an excellent way to, to answer that and i see gareth is nodding there and he certainly would would be a, a, an advocate for that type of approach so on, on those wise words i'm going to maybe call this part to a close i'm going to hand over and i'm going to, I'm going to introduce gareth first and then um he can take it over from there so thank you and um, for that and uh, for those insights it's very very useful because i think in anything we do if we don't have the student voice core to this activity it will not be successful so thank you very much for that so our next contributor is uh, gareth hughes who's the clinical lead for student minds in the university of derby so um student minds has been a fantastic initiative in the uk a wonderful resource uh, for anybody who doesn't know about it uh, so uh, just as a, that's a plug for student minds in the first place uh, but gareth is a, a psychotherapist he's a researcher and author of be well learn well a book for university students um, and I, I've, I've had the pleasure of um, uh, being on panels with Gareth a number of times. Uh, he's already contributed to the U21 for the Deans of Graduate Studies and Mental Health. Um, so we're, he's no, um, he's he's, uh, he's well known to us in, U, in, in U21, as he is in UK uh, Council for Graduate Education uh, as well in terms of supporting mental health of students and being a real champion. And um, so again, his bio is in your pack, but uh, I just feel that uh, to kind of put, to, to call out a champion for for student mental health at a whole university approach is a is a fantastic um person to have uh, and who's prepared to come and give his time so Gareth, i'm going to hand over to you thank you very much bro thank you and i'll i'll just um get my slides up so we can go from there and and absolutely i, I agree and completely with the last point there about the, the need for co-creation between students and universities and between students and mental health services is so important otherwise those of us who are based in student services and, and, and places like SciCat can end up providing things which students actually aren't interested in, don't want and aren't meeting their needs. It's a, it's a really, really uh, sensible and, and important point that you make. So I'm gonna talk just for a little bit of time about um, whole university approaches to student mental health and thinking in those bigger things, a bit like the, the students from the University of Glasgow were, were talking earlier on about that, that need to think a little bit more broadly than, than just about what we provide in terms of services overall. Um, now, just before, as I begin, I'm, I'm going to talk about mental well-being and, and well-being generally, rather than talking about just through the mental health lens, because I think it's really important that we think about this in a, in a much broader context. 
you know, the word well-being in itself just to be is a, is a confusing word that gets talked about in lots of different ways and, and had lots of different definitions. Um, so I just want to be quite clear from, from my perspective and the way I'm talking about it today. I'm talking about a very holistic version of well-being, which is about thinking about physical well-being, psychological well-being, and social well-being. And for students with that academic bit added on to it, that we're thinking across that whole experience, because we know that actually our mind, body, and environment are in a constant relationship with each other. They're constantly interacting. And so if we're really thinking about people's mental health and well-being, we have to be thinking about all of those things together. And I want to really just set off just by saying that although everyone in this call is probably very committed to the idea of paying attention to student mental health and, and mental health in universities generally, that's not necessarily the case for everyone. There will still be voices of caution. There are still people who we need to convince. And I think there are a number of concerns and misconceptions that we need to be able to address directly. The first is that the focus on student mental health and well-being actually isn't what universities are for and, and that we're gonna distract from the core mission of, of kind of research and teaching or that, that thinking about student well-being and being caring about that actually will undermine academic integrity because in order to not stress students out, we'll make getting a degree far too easy. Or that we're asking universities to do things that aren't universities' responsibility and that they've never really been involved in. And I think another misconception that mental illness is something which happens to an individual student and therefore is just something which is of an interest to that individual who should then go and just get care for themselves. And I think, again, that's a misconception. I'll hopefully just unpick a little bit in this very quick presentation that we're doing. Just to deal with the issue about universities never being involved in this before, actually historically universities have, have long had a responsibility for centuries for, for wider student experience and student health. By the 15th century universities, at least in Europe, were accepting that they had wider responsibilities for students and at that point students actually had to be in bed by a certain time of night. But certainly since post-World War II in the West, certainly in, in America, Canada, uh, the UK and Australia, you were seeing universities talking very specifically uh, about mental health. This is Sarah Crook's paper down in the bottom corner looking at, at studies in the UK of, of universities since the Second World War actually talking about mental health of students and being concerned about what they needed to do about that. And if we think about the core mission of universities, for me, this is about universities exist to produce wisdom, to create practical wisdom in our population. And we do that by research, by, by broadening our knowledge and understanding of the world through research, and by teaching so that our students learn and they grow their own wisdom that they can then carry out into our communities to make the world a better place. And if we think about the way mental health impacts on those core missions, one of the things we know is that when people are highly distressed, whether they're anxious or depressed or angry or whatever it is, that disrupts the brain's ability to learn. It negatively impacts on the parts of our brain that we use for academic learning. And it literally shuts them down. Lots of chemicals surge into those parts of the brain to stop them functioning. So learning becomes much more difficult when you're highly distressed or stressed. It's far more difficult to be creative. It's far more difficult to problem solve and be creative. And those low levels of well-being can then become quite exhausting and leads to low motivation. So whether you're a student in an undergraduate program or you're an academic trying to undertake research, high levels of distress, poor well-being and poor mental health will stop you being able to engage in those core missions to the extent that you otherwise could be. On the flip side of that, we know that positive well-being is absolutely related to creativity and concentration. And if you look at Chantelli Mahali's, uh, Mahali's work on flow, we can see very much that flow, which is a peak state when you're really able to concentrate, you can be really creative, ideas come from everywhere. It's all just happening. That flow state emerges from states of good, positive well-being. So there's a real strong argument for us to avoid negative mental health and negative well-being and to really work to try and um, push up positive well-being and positive mental health in university communities, because those are the things that will also drive up good learning and good research. The people doing that learning and research are human beings. And so we've got to be focused on what is it that makes human beings really function and learn and perform well. And good mental health and well-being is a crucial part of it. So then what is it that impacts on the well-being of these people who are learning and conducting research? Well, the truth is, it's everything. Because as, as, as animals, we are responsive to the environment that we are in. Everything that we encounter, everything that we do during the course of the day, all of the things that we think, all have an impact on our well-being and our mental health, whether positive or negative. So as universities, what that then means is, all universities have a whole university response to mental health and well-being. Everything that we do as universities is impacting on the mental health and well-being of our students and our staff. 
Some of it will be really well thought out. Some of it will be, will be those excellent services that we're providing or a really well taught class or resources. Some of it will be having a negative impact because we maybe haven't even thought about it. If you think about the, what our students just shared from Glasgow for, our, for their disabled students, where the layout of the building isn't accessible, that, that inaccessibility, as they were showing, can have a negative impact on mental health and well-being because that, in, that inaccessibility says you don't really belong. This isn't really set up for you. Um, th there are practical difficulties you've got to overcome. There's more work you've got to do to just be able to do the things that everyone else does. And as a result of all of that, that then has a negative impact on well-being. So as universities, we then must become conscious of everything that we're doing and how it then impacts on the mental health and well-being of all of our population, of our total population and everyone within it. And there's all kinds of elements to this that we can think about. So, I mean, you think about sleep. So for, for students who, who move into university accommodation, if the accommodation is very noisy or very cold or very drafty or whatever, and it disrupts their sleep, we know that that's going to disrupt their learning and it's going to pull their moods down overall. And they're more likely to be anxious as a result of that. We know that being in nature, if you have trees and greenery and animals nearby, that has a positive impact on well-being, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're focused on it. But actually, if you spend time focusing on that nature and focusing on, on the things around you though, from the natural world, that boosts your well-being to a really measurable extent. And that, that there's a kind of a, a prolonged period of time after you've been engaged with nature when it continues to do you good. We know that exercise is really good for learning and well-being. The way students are taught, the way the curriculum is shaped, the way assessment happens, lots of work and lots of studies demonstrating that that can have a really powerful effect, not only on learning, but also on student well-being. The one that pulls it all together for me, and, and I started off by talking about that my version of well-being that I'm talking about is about physical, psychological and social all connected, is if you look at what goes wrong when, when social things don't work for students. So particularly when they experience loneliness, when students experience loneliness, when that loneliness goes up immediately, cognitive functioning drops, the ability of the brain to function to its optimum level drops away, learning becomes more difficult, um, problem solving becomes more difficult, and there is really good research evidence to show that loneliness reduces academic performance. The other really interesting thing that happens is when someone feels lonely, their immune system also stops functioning to the optimum level. You're more likely to get, pick up the cold virus if you feel lonely than if you don't. So you can see just that feeling, that negative emotional feeling of not being connected to other people dramatically drops your ability to perform academically and makes you more likely to become ill because all of these things are connected. Everything is connected together in that way. So what does that mean for us as universities? It means we've got to take this whole university approach. Now, there's a whole number of ways to conceptualize this. So what I'm going to talk to you about is what we've done in the UK. And we've created something called the University Mental Health Charter, which is a, a kind of a guidance document to guide universities to what a whole university approach needs to look like. And then we put alongside that an award that universities can apply for when they can demonstrate that they're, they're meeting the principles of good practice within that charter framework. And we've put together a program to work with universities to help them get ready for that award and, and improve their whole university approach. And the way we talk about whole university approach within that is that there need to be three kind of things that universities are doing. First of all, there's those resources that the students were talking about earlier, those services, they've got to be well accessed. As, as you heard from the students from Glasgow, if waiting lists are perceived to be really long, students just won't go and access them. So they've got, we've got to resource them properly, we've got to run them properly, and we've got to provide proactive interventions as, as, as we were hearing from South Africa, because if we're not out working with the students doing that proactive work, they won't necessarily come and access those services because it just feels at a distance and like it's talking to you at a distance. The second thing is we've just got to try and get that environment and culture right. So for those disabled students who, who feel that the, the campus is inaccessible, we've got to get that right. We've also got to get the social bit right so that people can feel that they belong, that they feel safe, that they can make friends, that they can feel connected. So the whole culture has to support that good well-being and the well-being of staff as well, by the way. And then the final thing is we've then also got to work with individuals and communities within our university so that they can look after their own well-being, so that they can be self-sustaining, so they can manage themselves and do things from an informed perspective that then it was good for their own well-being, so they can get good sleep, good exercise, spend time with friends, and have that balance which is going to bring them good well-being overall. And we think of this as our kind of three legs of a stool model, that you need that really healthy environment that's really conducive to well-being. 
We need that proactive support out to our individuals and communities to help them look after their own well-being and look after each other. And then you need safe, effective services that are accessible all year round for those students who need it when things go wrong and for staff who need it when things go wrong. And without either one of those, you're kind of not, you don't really have a whole university approach. You've got to try and think across all of that together. So that's what we did with the University Mental Health Charter. What we've done is we've put together, and, and, and as I said, there's a whole range of ways in which you conceptualize this and you can think about all of this. But the charter itself contains 18 different themes because we're really trying to think all the way across um, everything a university does. So we talk about learning and teaching, for instance. We look at the transition into university coming into the first year and progression from year to year. So what does the curriculum need to look like? How do we need to assess and teach? We look at support, we look at what do our support services need to look like? How do we manage when students are at risk if their mental health really isn't good at all? We look at how you share information within the institution and with, with others, for with families, for instance, or with uh, other services out there. And we look at how universities need to work together with external health providers. We look at staff mental health, we look at also the preparation that staff get for working with students when um, they are uh, having problems with their mental health. We know many staff who just don't feel equipped to respond when students come to talk, but particularly academic members of staff who very often feel they're very outside their comfort zone. Um, we look at that kind of whole environmental aspect of this, and we also look at things like leadership, at, at the role of leaders in universities and what it is that they need to do in order to make sure that well-being is really backed into every policy and every strategy right across the institution. And I think one of the key things that for me in all of this is that lots of the things that we're concerned about in universities, whether it's research or learning, whether we're thinking about the equity agenda, whether we're thinking about um, trying to prepare students for life after university in terms of employability, whether we're concerned about the first year experience and transition, whatever it is that we're looking at, if you think about that through the lens of well-being, if you sit and say to yourself, well, who are our students and what do we need to do to maximize their well-being? Who are our staff? And what do we need to do to maximize their well-being? When you think about that, what you will be doing is preparing the environment and the ground for those students and staff to be really successful at the things that universities need to be successful at. You will be preparing the ground for people to deliver brilliant research. You will be preparing the ground for your students to learn to their maximum potential, to achieve academically really well and to be ready to step out into the world afterwards and to take all of that learning and all of that resource and all of that self-management with them to then transform their communities in the world outside of that. So that's what we're trying to do through the charter. Now we've just closed the doors on our first applications, our first cohort. The first cohort is going to be 41 universities from the UK. That's about a quarter of the universities in the UK with degree awarding powers. We're just working with universities with degree awarding powers at the moment. So we're really pleased. We're off to a fantastic start. That's far more than we expected straight away, especially after the COVID pandemic hit. We're gonna be working with those 41 universities now within our program to help them develop their whole university approach and to get ready for the award. And what we're gonna be doing is, is this is a, an improvement program. We're gonna be using the charter to try and improve those whole university approaches in every one of those universities. And then taking all of the learning from those universities and sharing them back out to all the other universities who aren't part of this yet. And then hopefully they will all apply in time. And over time, every university in the UK will have a really good whole university approach to student mental health. And that, that's our ambition. And that's our hope. And we really believe, fundamentally believe, that it is absolutely possible to improve the well-being of our university communities uh, right across the UK and hopefully globally right across the world, as you're trying to do within University Last 21. So... That was a very quick rattle through all of that. I'll stop talking now and hopefully we'll take some questions and I will uh, take my slides down so we can see everybody. Thanks, Gareth. So I am going to open it up for people who have questions. You can either raise your hand or you can pop it in the chat, whichever. But um, I'm going to start off while people are kind of gathering their thoughts and, and, and Maria and others, if they want to kind of come in. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to first ask you to think, uh, to talk us to particularly, you, I'm going to go back to your loneliness, one of the, uh, and, and that sense of belonging and the connectedness and the whole team of the conference is kind of post, you know, COVID or post COVID. So we all know that uh, our, the, those, many, our students are kind of going to going into second year this year, have had no real first year integration to the university like we would have expected. Um, and so their whole big, group of those students going to feel very disconnected, 
potentially lonely, potentially isolated, with an expectation they can just get on with it because they're not, we, we, we tend to focus on our first years when they come in. So we're going to have these two groups who really need our support. Um, have you thought about, you know, particularly given the numbers that if you talk about the UK, South Africa, Ireland, wherever we are in the world, we're going to have a lot of students who are in need of that support as they, as they transition. And even if they've been in school, they may have been not as connected to, to, their, to their peers as well. So what, what kind of strategies can universities put in place to actually help that transition, particularly the loneliness piece? Because uh, I think your point is so well made. Absolutely. I mean, I think some of the, the, the really scary statistics, I mean, from the UK, we know that of the, the current second years who are just coming in, um, one quarter have reported having no friends at university at all. None. Um, so absolutely. It's, I mean, that's, and that is a terrifying statistic. And, and, and we, as I said, we know the impact that loneliness has on mental health and academic learning and everything else. And I think really universities have got to almost treat their second years this year as if they are first years coming in for the very first time. We've got to recreate those social circumstances and situations in which we, we create the social group. The problem when social groups get formed is, is people then feel unable to break into them. The lovely thing at the very beginning of first year is everybody knows everyone's in the same position and everyone's open to talking to everyone else. We've almost got to say to our second years, we're recreating that space. We're going to recreate those social rules. For the next three weeks, everyone can talk to everyone. If you go into a room and you see people talking, you can go up and just introduce yourself and start talking to them. And everybody's got to be nice to everybody else and, and, and create that space for that to happen. Um, I think we've got to be very active in class where we're having smaller classes together at devoting some time to people just meeting and getting to know each other. Because you can't do that level of learning that we want students to do if they're in that place where they're lonely and disconnected. So we've got to try and create those collaborative classroom spaces. And actually, I would say, you know, making adjustments to the curriculum to prioritize. I mean, some of the research we did a few years ago kind of showed that students need to do the social bit before they can do the learning bit. So let's give the time in the curriculum to just saying, OK, first week in, we're just all going to get to know each other properly in the same space. Um, and I, but you're absolutely right. If we don't devote the time and the resource to giving second years the opportunity to make those social connections, then they're going to be continue to run into trouble throughout the rest of the year because they're never going to be properly grounded. They're not going to be connected. And that loneliness pit is going to just con continue to just interfere with their learning. Um, does anybody else want to put a question to, to Gareth at this particular stage? Can I? Maria. Can I, yes, hi. Hello, Gareth. Thank you. That was hi. so interesting. It's really, really good to hear all your, all your work. It's always impressive. Can I just add on the loneliness in the first years? Um, just a bit of research we've just done actually on social network in the first years mm -hmm. actually shows that even though they created some social network when they moved in the halls, they, this network was not deep enough mm -hmm. to actually feel that they have this like social connection. They met people, they make connections, but these connections actually were not as strong. And when we ask them quality data, they say we didn't have fun opportunities, we didn't get drunk together, they didn't actually mm -hmm. reach that level of feeling feeling really close to other people to, to find this um, relationship meaningful. And I think this is exactly where we're, exactly as you say, we really have to give them opportunities for more meaningful um, yeah. relationships to build. But the really important point about that, of course, is Maria, that, and that's really interesting to hear um, and fits exactly with other things we're hearing. But, but the, the really interesting thing about that is that we know that loneliness isn't about the number of people. You can, you can be surrounded by people and still be lonely. It's exactly that quality and depth of relationship that you're talking. It's emotional intimacy. It's that emotional connection to people that, that, that stops loneliness from happening. Um, so you're right. It, it's possible that they may know people, but that isn't going to necessarily be deep enough because of the experiences they've had. That's, so that's a really useful contribution, Maria. Thank you. And, and also, again, I just wanted to I have a question. Can I just go on mm. a second? Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Please, of course. Please do. Space to anyone. Um, I think what we've seen last year is like we all moved to online, but however, probably this sort of teaching and learning will stay, probably we're going to move to blended approaches. This gives opportunities for some universities to over recruit. We have this and we've seen this. Um, what will happen with them, this already depleted services? What can we do? Should we move on to more like low level, um, not diagnostic, but like um, tackling problems at the low level and the stress level rather than going to problems when they actually have a diagnostic uh, level. 
Would this be one approach? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think if any universities who are who are knowingly over recruiting and not putting services in place, there's there's a there is just a there's no good moral argument for that, frankly. And you know, Vincent Tinto's motto, which is that you know, access without support is not equity. So you know, if we're recruiting students and we're not supporting them, then we're not actually increasing access. We're not widening participation. There's no moral argument for that. You've got to put support in place alongside it. And if we are, if we are, and again, you know, what what one of the key things we know, one of the things that's a real protective factor for student well-being is if their lecturer knows their name. How does a lecturer know the name of their name if they've got 500? You know, so look, there are driving economic models that aren't helping. And, and I'm not necessarily blaming university leadership for this because they're under pressure from economic models that are being imposed on them that actually don't make sense with universities. But it's a problem. It is a problem. because, And it's going to be a problem for those core university missions because, um, you know, learning is not it, learning is not content delivery. You can't just it's, it's not like putting content into a computer and putting stuff into someone's brain. It's a relational thing. You need contact with other people. You need to feel part of a community. So um, I just don't think it works. And I think where it's been tried, what you'll probably find is satisfaction rates for those courses will go down. They'll stop recruiting. It'll be very good financially for a couple of years, but actually it'll just put a hole in the program. So I, I don't think it makes sense. Thank you for that. We're going to have to come to a close and we less than a minute to go. And I think you've actually made the case for face-to-face -face campus there at the end, Gary, without telling me that. And I, I would be a huge advocate at the moment here. There are people asking about doing at-distance PhDs and UCD, whereas the university I'm in, we would very much see ourselves. Now, we do have some online programs, but we would definitely see ourselves as a face-to-face -face campus. And many of those things is that it is about building relationships, having, having students engaged with us, and even have, feeling brilliant about about it when, when they leave, that they've made these friendships, which are a lot more difficult to actually to create and, and support and, and over time online. So I think that being, and, and we are we are people who crave other people in mm -hmm. general anyway, we are social beings. Now, we some are. of us might only need one or two people. Some of us need 20 people. It's not about the number. It is about being human, being connected. So, and I think that's done best face to face. So um, I might, I'm going to end on, on that. If you, if you think that's an appropriate way to end, I'm going to thank you very much, Gareth, for your contribution. Um, and Maria and, and Tamani and all of the, the, and particularly our students who, who, who came today and to give up their time and also to give us insights about the importance of the student voice being core to, to what we're doing in our institutions. So uh, many thanks to everybody. And uh, no doubt, see you again um, along the way. So many thanks.